Good morning and welcome to View from the Other Side. This is the 25th lecture in this series and the last that I will have the pleasure of presenting to you. When I invented View from the Other Side back in 1985, it was certainly with a view towards providing speakers for you who would increase your knowledge of copyright and intellectual property. It was also with an eye towards giving you a feel and a sense of the importance of the registration system to the copyright community and to the nation. So when I look back over my 23 years here and I think about what I would like to have accomplished, I can think of nothing better than having contributed positively to your view of yourself, to your view of the value of your work. And I hope through this series I have in part accomplished that goal. I first met our speaker this morning, David Booker, about two years ago when we were speaking together on a program in New York City. We found ourselves in the back of the room together poring over notes and right away we knew um, we were both on the program. Um, we, <clears throat> we talked about our respective offices and decided that we would each benefit from hearing about the other. So last September I went over to the trademark office and spoke to the examiners and after several unsuccessful attempts we scheduled David to speak today little knowing that it would be my next to the last day in the copyright office and that on Monday I would be joining David at the trademark office. One of the things that impressed me so much about David was the breadth of his background. Now let me tell you a little bit about him. He received his undergraduate degree from Temple University and Messiah College. He then went on to Eastern Mennonite College and received a BA in Business Administration, then to the National Law Center at GW where he graduated with honors. He has worked for the Mennonite Aid Association. He has been an attorney investigator for the Three Mile Island Accident Investigation Subcommittee. He has been a deputy campaign coordinator. He's actually been an examining attorney in the trademark office. He's also been a legislative assistant for Senator Paul Simon. And presently he is director of the trademark examining groups. And what he does there is to administer, plan, and coordinate um, the activities of the trademark examining groups. There are about 200 attorneys there. They're divided into what they call 13 law offices that I'm sure David will tell you more about. Um, just as a point of comparison, the trademark office examines about 120,000 applications a year. Please welcome David Booker. Thank you, Jody. Those of you who have had occasion, uh, as I have over the years, to talk to reporters can relate to one of my recent experiences. Um, after spending almost an hour explaining the particular facts of a trademark case, uh, giving the reporter a primer in trademark law, and uh, repeatedly hedging my bets with caveats like, uh, no, I don't have any personal opinion about whether this person is committing fraud in the trademark office and bilking consumers out of billions of dollars and the like. Um, the latter, of course, designed to help me keep my job. Um, the story was published containing the statement, Mr. Booker, an official with the Patent Office, conf <laughs> confirmed that his unit has refused to grant a trademark registration for Company X's new copyright. <laughs> I give up. Um, there's a, a couple of things wrong with that, the latter being most obvious perhaps to this group. Um, in the 1970s, the name of the Patent Office was changed to the Patent and Trademark Office, uh, despite the fact that for many years the Trademark Office had been a valuable uh, part of that organization. Uh, secondly, we don't grant anything. We issue trademark registrations, and I'll talk a little bit more later about uh, that bundle of sticks and substantive property rights that one gets in a trademark, uh, having, uh, at least before 1989, having nothing to do with what we did in the office. Finally, of course, uh, we don't know too much about copyrights. We do send uh, uh, dozens of calls to you every day from my office to uh, people who think that uh, the patent office is the place for them to get a copyright. And uh, uh, sometimes with uh, those non-attorney pro se applicants, it takes long periods of discussion to figure out exactly what it is that they want. Uh, and uh, very often, we do send them your direction. 
I do feel uh, an additional kinship with this group. I, uh, as Jody mentioned, have been fortunate to appear on a number of panels uh, dealing with uh, computer law issues and other copyright issues such as uh, post uh, uh, Feist, uh, Feist and his progeny kind of cases. I also see a number of other people in the room uh, who have uh, been on those uh, seminars with uh, John Baumgarten, Jody Rush, and others. Um, while I rarely read patent cases in the United States Patent Quarterly, Patents Quarterly, and incidentally that's the name of a publication that I think probably you agree with us all, probably ought to be changed to really uh, reflect what's in there. Um, I don't rarely read patent cases, but do find myself uh, reading the copyright cases and over the years have found uh, uh, many of the copyright cases to be of, of some interest. Perhaps that reflects my liberal arts background, uh, like many of you here. And most recently, I do feel a, a debt of gratitude uh, to uh, you all for uh, letting us steal away Jody. Uh, as she mentioned, we had uh, planned to uh, exchange visits to each other's organizations uh, long before um, she had conceived of making that change. Let me tell you how I will spend my time, uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have quite a bit of time for questions and answers. Uh, I think perhaps the most beneficial way we can spend our time is for me to attempt to answer the questions that you may have about trademark law, uh, the trademark office, and uh, uh, what it is that we do. I'm going to start by talking a bit more about the trademark office. I'll give you um, a sense of the history of trademarks and then uh, some of the highlights of, of trademark practice before we go to uh, questions and answers. As Jody noted in the introduction, I was hired a little more than 10 years ago as a trademark examining attorney. Um, and I felt in my early days at the trademark office that I had made a serious mistake. Um, I went home uh, literally in tears uh, many of the early days that I was there, uh, having discovered that the Trademark Office had recently been written up in some national publications as a national disgrace. Uh, they stuck me in a room that had the moniker the Romper Room, and I think there were probably eight or nine uh, examining attorneys sitting in this room, and there was some romping going on. Um, there were case files on all areas of the, this internal uh, room that had been there uh, more than a year since they had been filed that were still sitting there, and uh, in my observation, no one was coming in to get any of those cases, so they were getting old as the, older as the days went by. Um, I was walking down the hall the first day and uh, heard this middle-aged uh, examiner singing, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, um, <laughs> kind of monotone. Uh, uh, anyway, I could go on and on. The stories are legion. Um, the, the, the composite of the average examining attorney then was probably a 40-year-old uh, white male. Um, there were still a number of the returning GIs who had come to the trademark office immediately after World War II who uh, were not lawyers, uh, who had learned to examine by examining over the years, and uh, who's, uh, who were really putting in time uh, and were clearly ready to retire. The office had uh, been through a series of some severe budget problems in the late 70s. We, in fact, at one point had such a limited uh, budget in that period that we were unable to publish the trademark official gazette. There simply wasn't money to uh, publish the official gazette, uh, an important part of the opposition and registration process. I know most about the decade of the 80s in as much as that it is the period that I was there. Um, and if the 60s and 70s and before represented a certain period of stasis where things changed very little, the decade of the 80s was uh, a period of transition and there were incredible changes in the leadership, in the funding, uh, and in our relationship to our customers. Um, one of the good things that came out of the Reagan administration early on, uh, and I won't reflect to this group my uh, partisan uh, uh, positions, but uh, one of the, the very good things that Ronald Reagan did was to bring Malcolm Baldridge as Secretary of Commerce to the organization. The Patent and Trademark Office is part of the Secretary of Commerce, or is part of the Department of Commerce, excuse me. Um, the late Malcolm Baldridge, um, really had uh, a way of seeing things that uh, didn't work and how to fix them, uh, along with Jerry Mossinghoff, who was then the new uh, Commissioner of Patents and Trademarks. Um, those of you who know Jerry and uh, read the papers know that uh, as President of APA now, he has a salary of the first two rows here. Um, but uh, in any case, he um, was also another dynamic uh, person with a vision. and. President Reagan retained uh, Margaret Lawrence, who was uh, one of the few political carryovers from the Carter administration. And what they did, in, in, in essence, 
was seeing the problems the trademark office had. Um, the trademark bar, with, uh, with the support of the trademark bar, the Secretary of Commerce went to the Hill and in essence cut a deal with uh, the Hill and uh, the kind of complaints that the relevant committees were getting there. We want better service from the trademark office and the trademark bar says we are willing to pay for it. So that what happened in 1981-82 was a, a five-fold increase in fees. We were charging an average of $35 a class. Overnight, we went to $175. We became 100% fee funded. And with uh, the dynamic leadership that I referred to earlier, we changed very quickly as an organization. We also, uh, the, the way uh, our improved uh, performance was measured was with something called Goal 313. Now, it sounds very mechanistic, but uh, in essence, Goal 313 is that we promise to send out an office action on an average of three months from the time an application walks in the door. We also committed to reaching 13-month average pendency to issue a registration or dispose of the application by abandonment. Um, if one contrasts uh, in 1981, for example, Goal 313 with what we actually had, we would have been at something like 1328 so that there clearly was a great deal of uh, headway to be made with more compact prosecution. Um, several of my predecessors whose labor skills perhaps weren't that great, but who uh, knew how to reach a goal, cracked the whip and really helped to change the, the corporate culture. The average first action when I came in would be something like, of course, you have to realize it's been more than a year that the file has not been seen by an attorney, or even then it could be a non-attorney examiner. Pick up the file, and they're getting credit for actions, for simply pumping out letters. So that first action that totes one more on the tote board is, uh, you know, dear applicant, um, not sure exactly what it is you're doing. Send me some specimens so I can, send me some brochures so I can figure out what you're doing. Uh, you know, lovingly yours, examining attorney. And the letter would go out. The statute gives the applicant six months to respond. The re attorney would send back a reply saying, here's a brochure. My client is doing the following. Uh, can you please search my mark? Um, of course, when that amended file came back, it went into the second file cabinet in the last drawer, and five months later had wend its way to the front, and another non-substantive kind of action, often deferring a search, was done. Um, what we did was we basically changed the, uh, the focus of the examiners to basically say to them, you need to do a complete first action. You do a search in every case. Every conceivable issue that could come up needs to be dealt with in the first action. And when and if you can't resolve that action, you will do a second action final. And we started firing people. And we started teaching the old dogs new tricks. And some people who couldn't stand the heat left. And we had a high turnover rate. So we were bringing in lots of new, young, bright people who really understood that our goal was to register trademarks. Um, there's been a sea change in the corporate culture uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and finally, that affected our relationship with the bar immensely. Uh, my perception, at least, of a lot of my colleagues then was they were low-esteem people who somehow had fallen into trademarks, didn't like the area, didn't develop the passion for it that uh, many of the rest of us had, and they didn't want to be there. They had been promoted enough, and they had now a mortgage and uh, a wife and two kids and a picket fence and the dog, and they basically wanted to go sell themselves, having done nothing substantive for years, and the very people who wanted to hire them were the ones who had gotten their lousy actions and they wanted to sell themselves for $45,000, $50,000 a year, and these people are saying, what, you don't even know civil procedure anymore. Uh, we'll pay someone right out of law school half that salary. And so you had a lot of unhappy people who didn't want to be there. Um, that, too, has changed, and I'm happy to report that uh, we are now uh, reviewing 100 applications from lawyers who, for every position that we finally hire someone for. People are coming to us from private law firms. Uh, when I first came in, it was people are dying to get out of here. So that uh, I can't emphasize too much that the decade of the uh, 80s have been an, uh, a period of transition, and I now view the decade of the 90s that we're in as one of, of incredible uh, dynamism, and the chance for further change uh, cannot be overstated. Why don't you all come down and sit in the front? Is it okay. <laughs> Welcome. <clears throat> the, um, to give you a little bit more a sense of uh, the idea of uh, our personnel, we basically have begun an attorney recruitment program where we uh, put out uh, notices in the Washington Post and uh, other publications 
And uh, last year, we had 2,500 applications and ended up hiring 20 people. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful kind of uh, market as an employer to be in. And we are uh, able to attract and retain some wonderful people. Of course, our goal now is to, uh, is to try to, to keep them with us uh, as long as we can. We have improved our academy. We have a 10-week academy for new attorneys that come in. And uh, we intersperse examining along with lectures from our senior attorneys. We're increasingly targeting cases. We pull cases and give them uh, cases that relate to the topics they're going to be lectured on. Um, we have a mentoring system where a more senior attorney, who is actually now a, a member of management, is a, a permanent mentor. We, we're doing less hand-holding. We're doing less of the learn to write the way I'm writing, but are doing a great more, a deal more of the uh, modeling after law firms where there is a perhaps unlike law firms, we have a certain uh, gentle, caring, nurturing kind of environment, but we do say, I am here as your mentor to help you. Uh, if you have questions, come to me. I will uh, look over your work initially, but we're trying to accelerate people through a signatory authority process as quickly as we can. Time doesn't permit me to talk about a variety of the other exciting things that we're doing in the personnel area, but suffice to say, we have improved the grade structure of uh, about 80% of our employees, clerical employees in particular, in the past several years which has given us a better shot of, again, retaining the better people and competing for um, we're getting more and more uh, employees from failed banks in the Washington area, people who are literate and uh, good with numbers and uh, provide us with an excellent job market. In terms of growth, to give you some idea of the kind of growth that we've experienced, in the decade of the 70s, we received about 40,000 applications a year for trademark uh, registration. In fiscal year 1989, which was uh, the first year before the Trademark Law Revision Act went into effect, we had what was then a record 84,000 applications. In fiscal year 90, which is the first year that comprised uh, the effective date of intent to use in the Trademark Law Revision Act, we got 125,000 uh, trademark applications. So it was more than a 50% increase in filings. Um, I used to go to USTA, AIPLA, and other meetings, and when there was question time for the panels involved in the Trademark uh, Law Revision Act, the Trademark Review Commission, I was always up there, what do you think the impact is going to be in filings? Uh, of course, my interest in that was, uh, is obvious to those of you who are involved in another examination process, and that is for every 800 increase in filings, I needed to recruit, hire, and train another examining attorney. Uh, we did see some fall off with the uh, whole variety of reasons. I think some of the applications in that would have normally come in in fiscal year 91 were stolen and moved into 90 to accelerate the, uh, the process, uh, the recession, and a whole variety of other kinds of things. We basically leveled off last year. In fact, we dipped a little bit. This year looks like we'll be at 125 to 130,000 applications again. In terms of numbers of attorneys, in 1979 there were 45 examining attorneys. Um, when I became director uh, five years ago, there were around 80 attorneys. Uh, and as of today, we are right at uh, 200 attorneys, which I think probably makes us the largest intellectual property firm on the face of the earth. <clears throat> in terms of physical space, we also have moved from doubling all of our examining attorneys in a 30-year-old Charles Smith building in, Charles Smith, in uh, Crystal City to, uh, unfortunately, still in Crystal City, but a new high-rise 10-story building that uh, we outfitted, uh, spent $5 million basically upgrading it and trying to provide uh, something approaching a law office uh, environment as opposed to the normal uh, government uh, kind of structure. And for those of you who uh, have not been or have an interest, uh, let me invite you to come and uh, tour our building. You'll have additional reason now to come down and see us. Uh, and uh, if Jody can't give you a tour, I would be happy to. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to tell this group about some of the excitement in intellectual property generally. Uh, certainly, uh, Jeff Samuels, my boss, the Assistant Commissioner for Trademark, seems to uh, probably need a second home in Geneva with uh, his uh, many tours over there to deal with the, the new Madrid protocols, uh, dealing with uh, attempts on the part of WIPO to improve trademark harmonization. Uh, certainly, when we don't know what's going to happen with GATT, but uh, certainly one reads about uh, uh, the intellectual property component of uh, the GATT negotiations as a significant part of that. Uh, the Trademark Law Revision Act which really turned trademark law upside down two years ago, and my office is at the epicenter of those kind of changes. And the final measure of it must be the number of times that trademarks has appeared in L.A. law uh, over the past uh, year. <laughs> I think the count now stands at about six. 
Finally, our automation effort, uh, there's good news and bad news on the automation uh, side. The good news is we've got lots of computers. Um, the bad news is only some of them work the way they were uh, uh, promised. I really do think we have probably our own group of guardian angels at GAO uh, who spend quite a bit of time looking over our shoulders. We also have implemented total quality management uh, in an organization, particularly in the patent side, that has tended to be uh, pretty theory X, uh, top down. Uh, we'll tell our employees how to jump, uh, how high to jump, and uh, uh, you know, if you want more productivity, simply beat them harder. Uh, that's not my approach. Uh, and being that trademarks is about one tenth of the entire organization, uh, the federally mandated OMB driven uh, TQM effort is one that I have embraced as a, a different way of. Uh, motivating our employees. Well, let me move on quickly to the history of trademarks. Um, the ancient roots of trademarks are really in dispute. The various scholars uh, don't agree about how far back they go, whether it's pottery markings 4,000 years ago, uh, actual use on goods uh, 6,000 years ago, uh, branding of cattle uh, in various continents before there were written languages, or uh, certainly during the Greek and Roman period uh, commerce. Um, there is some agreement about the medieval period in the 14th and 15th centuries where there were personal marks where people would mark things to say this belongs to me or belongs to my family uh, and proprietary marks which are closer to the way we think of trademarks nowadays whether it would be the, the guilds or various uh, geographical and other kind of areas. The common law in England in the 17th century and in the United States in the 18th century uh, started to focus what kind of right were trademark rights and, and moved uh, shifted in generally from an emphasis on fraud or fraudulent passing off to uh, a greater concern for the, the plaintiff's property rights in, in some kind of infringement dispute. The first Trademark Act in the United States uh, was passed in 1870 and was based on Article 1, Section 8, uh, Science and the Useful Arts, of course, which is where your uh, constitutional uh, authority comes from. Uh, in the trademark cases of uh, 1879, the Supreme Court struck down that law as unconstitutional. Um, uh, so that uh, later trademark acts uh, were all based on the Commerce Clause uh, as opposed to Article 1, Section 8. Um, interestingly, two years after the Supreme Court decision in 1881, a very timid Congress passed a new trademark act uh, which limited its scope uh, of commerce to, quote, foreign countries and Indian tribes. Um, there were several later largely inadequate uh, uh, approaches in 1905 and 1920. Uh, the first modern trademark act um, and it's our, really our current statute, uh, took more than 12 years to pass the United States Congress and was uh, pushed by uh, uh, Senator uh, Lanham and is appropriately named the Lanham Act and was finally passed after World War II ended. Uh, it became effective in, in 1946. So we refer to it as the Lanham Act, the Act of 46, or just the Act. Um, and it was not amended significantly until the Trademark Law Revision Act of 1988. Now, what are the benefits of trademark registration? As I alluded to earlier, Historically, under the common law and, and to present, one can get that bundle of sticks, those property rights, by simply using the mark. So you adopt it, you start using it, it's yours. You have those property rights and can assert them against someone, a junior user, who begins using that mark at some later date. But there are several reasons why one would want to secure a federal trademark registration. The first have to do with those evidentiary reasons, getting into a federal court without having to prove uh, $10,000 amounts and uh, basically you waive your registration, you get into a federal court. Needless to say, if you are some surname person from New York City who is suing uh, mom and pop in uh, the bayou somewhere, uh, you don't want to be in the state court. So naturally it gives you access to the federal courts. Um, getting a registration serves as a constructive notice. When the registration issues, it basically cuts off the ability of later users to adopt in good faith. It's proof of ownership and exclusive right to use the mark. Now that is a prima facie initially when the registration first issues. After five years of continuous use following the registration, that becomes conclusive. At that point, the registration can't fall simply for reasons of likelihood of confusion and the like. Um, at that point, it's simply fraud or genericness or other kinds of uh, bases for which a registration can be canceled. And since the Trademark Law Revision Act went into effect, there is something new under uh, 7C of the Act, which has to do with uh, uh, contingent nationwide constructive use. It really is the same as if one had used the mark across the country uh, on the date of filing in our office. 
therefore it has put a greater premium on filing an application in our office than ever before. In a sense, we're creating that contingent bundle of sticks the date the application hits our office. There are remedial benefits that have to do with injunctions, money damages, uh, attorney's fees, uh, court costs. Um, one can send a trademark registration to the U.S. Customs uh, Department and use it to block uh, importation of uh, goods from a party other than uh, the applicant, uh, the registrant. Um, there are also, uh, under the Counterfeit Act of 84, there are criminal penalties and damages against counterfeiters that are available only to someone who has a principal registration. <clears throat> now, there are various categories of marks that we register. Um, while trademarks we use often to talk about the generic marks uh, that are uh, susceptible to registration, um, more often uh, it also means marks for goods as opposed to service marks, which are marks that are used for uh, services. Now, services is, are, is not defined anywhere in the Act, but uh, through case law all over the years has taken on a definition which basically is performance by a person to the specification and order of others, where the activity must be real, um, it must be for the benefit of others, as I suggested, and not merely incidental to the sale of goods or providing other services. Trademarks and service marks make up 99 point some percent of all of the applications that we process. There are other categories like collective trademarks and collective service marks. There are collective membership marks like AAA and others that you may be uh, familiar with. And certification marks like Underwriters Laboratory. But uh, those really make up uh, a really small portion of uh, all of the marks that we register. <clears throat> now in terms of types of marks, one of the, the wonderful things about the way the Lanham Act uh, was designed, and it is a modern trademark statute, and it has been a very malleable, uh, living, breathing kind of, uh, of statute. Um, the definition of trademark, which includes things like words, names, symbols, and devices, has grown over the years to include things that uh, Senator Lanham and the people who testified on behalf of the intellectual property organizations in the 30s and 40s could not have contemplated. Um, certainly we start with words where there's the whole gamut and there's kind of a spectrum of descriptiveness, all the way from arbitrary marks like dove or ivory for soap. Those are obviously common English words that are applied in a way that has no meaning uh, other than now as a trademark. They're the fanciful kind of terms, Xerox, and those are really, as many of you know, very, very strong marks uh, that take a lot of promotion, um, but uh, are on that spectrum of very strong marks. You move through suggestive marks, and those are the kind of things most people uh, aim for, uh, and whether it's arbitrary, fanciful, or suggestive, those are initially registrable in the principal register. Um, however, we spend a lot of time arguing with uh, applicants over whether something has crossed that rather nebulous line from suggestive to descriptive. Uh, descriptive marks, something that is merely descriptive or deceptively misdescriptive, is not registrable initially on the principal register. Those kind of marks require a showing of acquired distinctiveness. That is, while this was a dictionary term, while this clearly is descriptive of a feature or a characteristic or a use of, of this particular product or service, it has now become associated as a trademark, and we will require them uh, to demonstrate that acquired distinctiveness to us. Clearly, if you move beyond descriptive, you don't have a mark anymore, you have a generic term. And uh, we also uh, see a, a fair number of generic terms that uh, come to us for registration. <coughs> names certainly include anything from surnames, which initially are not protected, but if you've used a surname for five years, uh, that alone is usually enough to get it registered. Um, there are geographical names, and we're not quite as uptight about that as the, the uh, Europeans and reasons why we haven't joined things like the Madrid Agreement years ago. But uh, even there, if, it, uh, if, the, uh, if there's a problem with uh, geographicalness, acquired distinctiveness will overcome that kind of a refusal. Symbols, of course, numbers are the most frequent ones. We don't register model numbers, but if it has become something like 747, clearly that is a Boeing mark, and one can think of numerous other kinds of examples. The area of, for the most growth has been that in devices, and that this is where in recent, in the early years of the Lanham Act, courts would try to say, no, you can't register this configuration of a container, for example. It's not a device. They didn't, they didn't mean this when they said device. Happily, over the years as the case law has developed, the, the uh, focus has turned not to a definitional one, but to say, does it function as a trademark? 
And it's in this area where we have the most exciting and recent developments, even in the past 10 years. Um, ornamentation, things emblazoned all over the front of t-shirts. Um, does it function as a source indicator when someone sees that? Do they think of that as representing something, uh, uh, this shirt uh, having the imprimatur, for example, of, of Mork and Mindy, the old television show, which was a case that uh, had some notoriety in this area? Or is it simply a message-laden kind of thing? And those are the kind of distinctions that examining attorneys uh, have to make. Um, there are slogans. Uh, you know, the question is, is it puffery? Is it uh, advertising slogans? Or is it going to be seen uh, as a trademark? And there was the two all beef patty special sauce and that kind of, uh, of a mark. Um, one of the still contentious issues in some quarters is uh, a color case. And perhaps some of you know about that. Uh, Owens Corning has pink registered um, for insulation. Now, it's a unique kind of situation. The CAFC made a decision that it did function as a trademark in the face of many years of law that said a single color uh, cannot function as a trademark because of this color depletion theory. And uh, the wealthy, the wealthy uh, Fortune 100 company is going to get registrations for every color, and uh, poor competitors out there will not be able to even paint their products for fear of infringement. Um, well, you know, clearly on the facts, this was, I think, correctly decided. Um, uh, not everyone shares that opinion. Um, the uh, counterpoint kind of case, and I think the facts are different, is equal, which tried to get blue for its packaging, and uh, that was found not to function as a trademark. But um, just for your information, I mean, who in this room does not associate Pink Panther and put your house in the pink with Owens Corning? They have a high percentage of the market, and insulation is normally an off-white color. They spend extra money making it pink. Um, so, in any case, those are the kind of developments in the trademark area that, for those of us who've been around for the last decade, have found to be uh, pretty exciting. I didn't bring along, but for those of you who uh, peruse your grocery store aisles and see different tech size uh, uh, cleaner products, Glass Plus, um, uh, Fantastic, and a number of others, uh, may be surprised to know that the shape of those, uh, what used to be Morton Norwich, then Morton Thiokol, and I guess after uh, Challenger went down, they took that name off. But uh, there's a, a, a whole series of Texize products for which the container shape, a trapezoidal top and uh, a body shape kind of thing that fits your hand, uh, is actually registered as a trademark. Um, and there we deal with this two-step two process, one of functionality. Um, and, and that's a public policy question. Does, do competitors actually need to use this shape to compete? And then the second step of that process is one of distinctiveness. Are consumers going to recognize this particular shape of a container or a product uh, as a source indicator? We have a number of sound marks. The, uh, uh, the uh, what is it, NBC Chimes uh, is one of the ones that's registered, the mark basically being the treble cleft with the, the marks on it. Um, the, uh, the, the newest sensory kind of mark is a fragrance mark. Um, there was a, a Clark company that basically uh, adds a scent to its yarn and uh, embroidery threads. Uh, the, the mark was described as follows. A high impact, fresh floral fragrance reminiscent of plumeria blossoms. Uh, some of you here probably know what that smells like. Um, I don't. Um, for sewing threads and embroidery yarn. Um, so this is kind of the latest ability of the, the Lanham Act to uh, take on new kind of source indicators that uh, were uh, never contemplated years ago. I really think the analogy to Owens Corning uh, in that sensory case is probably a good one in as much as, and, and the board made it clear this was a narrow decision, that it simply is, for this type of product, no one has seemed to find scent to be a necessary component of the product. And they clearly went about the scent in order to make it a source indicator. Um, but if we're talking about household products, certainly uh, colognes and stuff like that, fragrance would never function as a source indicator, given that's a functional part of the product. <clears throat> well, let me move on to um, uh, workflow uh, very generally. And we have um, a very complex kind of processing. We do, in the final analysis, we print our official gazettes and our registrations with a photocomposition process so that we run computer uh, data tapes that go to uh, the government printing office to create both the registration and the Trademark Official Gazette. Our Trademark Official Gazette each week has now around 3,000 and will be growing to 4,000 marks. So every week we are publishing that number of marks for opposition in the Trademark Official Gazette. And that is largely a photocomposition <coughs> process. That's another change in the last decade where it used to be you processed a whole file 
then it was ready for publication, they would start entering the data and shooting the drawings and so on. Um, that necessarily means that from the time the application walks in the door, we create a data file. We shoot and digitize images that go into uh, our, search, our automated search system and are used as part of the uh, photo composition process. Um, our, the average file is amended about four or five times during the course of processing so that as the application goes through the system, it has to be changed, so it has to be text edited. We have to have people changing that uh, data. And uh, inevitably, we have had some quality problems. We're trying to get a whole, uh, control of those to make sure that the final product really reflects all those many amendments that may take place over a period of years in any given file. <coughs> now, a case file basically comes in. We put a file together. We create a database. It then goes to the law offices for examination. Um, and as Jody mentioned, we have a, around 200 examining attorneys and 13 law offices. They're divided according to goods so that we have one group of examining attorneys that does uh, clothing, fabrics, and handbags, for example, another that, that may do uh, mechanical kind of equipment. So there is some specialization. Uh, everyone is now doing service marks, which is a change of about a year ago. We encourage examining attorneys to use the telephone. The best way we can maintain our pendency is to use the telephone. The uh, private bar loves it, um, and we are able to do a significant amount of our work over the telephone. Uh, what used to take page after page after page of contingency kind of things, if this, then that, we can basically narrow the issues uh, quite a bit by using the telephone. Um, it also helps the uh, rather strict uh, production requirements that we place in our examining attorneys. <coughs> If a mark goes through the processing, uh, it's published for opposition. If it survives the opposition period, it then takes two different routes depending on whether it's a use application or intent to use. Um, I should perhaps say a few more words about intent to use. The, the uh, change that was, there was a great deal of pressure on was, in a sense, we were able to register marks for foreigners that never made use, but not for domestic uh, trademark owners. So there, and, and given that most of the trademark systems, I think we in the Philippines uh, were the only two countries in the face of the world two years ago who still had a system that required use. I assume now it's probably just the Philippines. Um, and so there was a great deal of pressure to level the playing field, create greater uh, parity between U.S. trademark owners and foreign trademark owners. That was part of the impetus behind uh, ITU filings. Um, earlier in the marketing process, when one has a bona fide intention to use the mark in commerce in ways that are consistent with uh, the industry, you can file an application, reserve that right, and, and then make use later. Now, the one way our intent system differs from many other uh, proposed use systems is that one does have to make use before getting a registration. So therefore, back to my workflow, it's published, it survived the opposition process, if in a use application you've survived the opposition proceeding, you then get a registration some weeks later after the photo composition process has gone through its required steps. If it's an ITU application, you then get something called notice of allowance. We send out a notice of allowance and that starts a time running. During the next six months, you can send in your allegation of use. If you're not able to do that, you get extensions of time. Those things can go on for up to 36 months. If one hasn't made use by the end of the 36-month period, your application's abandoned, and you've got to start all over again. Um, if you make use, we, the examining attorney once again uh, examines that use to make sure that all the substantive kind of uh, parts of the act, which still apply, are not violated in any way, that it is correct ownership, that the specimens reflect all those things that we examine for in a use application during the first examination. Uh, and then, if everything is okay, one gets a registration at that point. After a registration issues uh, under the new act, it's good for 10 years, provided one shows during the, between the fifth and sixth year that you're continuing to use the mark, filing what we call a, a Section 8 affidavit. Um, that's been tightened up to get rid of Deadwood, to basically make sure things on the registry are still alive. Now, one of the ways in which trademark registrations <coughs> do differ from either patents or copyrights certainly has to do with the term of its life. A trademark registration can be renewed forever, as long as you're using the mark now, every 10 years, you basically send in a renewal, send us a fee, and we will continue to maintain that registration, keeping other later filed applicants from getting something that would cause likelihood of confusion uh, with your mark. <clears throat> Let me bring this to a close quickly. I've, I've uh, run over a couple of substantive refusals. Certainly descriptiveness is one, geographicalness, surnames. Um, there, we spend... Uh, uh, 
a great deal of our time dealing with issues of likelihood of confusion. Uh, and those are the toughest ones. And when you have about 800,000 registered marks that you have to search every time uh, an application comes in, it's a two-pronged kind of test under likelihood of confusion. We look at the marks. We look at do they look alike? Uh, do they sound alike? Do they have a similar meaning or connotation? Um, and then if you have similar marks, we then look at the goods. Are they competitive? Are they complementary? Do they move in the same channels of trade? Or is there some kind of affiliation, uh, connection, or sponsorship that the average consumer would think was important? Some of the more interesting ones, I, for instance, have to deal with the scandalous and immoral section of the act. Uh, in order to have uniformity, all those come to me. Um, and uh, I will assure you some of those are uh, pretty bizarre. Oftentimes, uh, one has the sense that, um, you know, Probably there's not case law that would support a refusal of scandalous and immoral, but I don't want to be the one getting a call from the commissioner saying who in blazes is uh, making this decision over there. Um, we get some very interesting ones. In fact, we have one now that's on appeal to the board that very likely if the board uh, feels the pressure that I do from the commissioner, will probably decide it consistent with uh, the examining attorney's refusal, and it will probably go to the CAFC. Uh, it's uh, been in the wire services uh, uh, an AIDS activist uh, has uh, applied for a mark for Old Glory with a flag unfurled uh, that is clearly a, a condom uh, and uh, is done with the stars and stripes. Uh, and we've refused that as uh, uh, scandalous, immoral, and uh, the kind of thing. And the, the test sometimes is the little old lady in the Midwest rocking on her front porch. Is she going to blush? Uh, but in any case, there, there are other sections of the Act that uh, we have to deal with uh, and uh, do refuse if they violate those sections of the Act. Uh, the CAFC now have trademark Yes, yes. In fact, the, as you know, the CCPA being folded into the CAFC, among other courts, uh, they are our review in court, so that uh, cases that, uh, where the TTAB, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, sustains my office, uh, an appeal from that can be taken directly to the CAFC. Now the other option uh, some applicants want to do is if they figure that we're right but they want to get a federal district court some judge somewhere who's never seen a trademark before, they also have the right of having a trial de novo um, in a federal district court, uh, either in inter parties or ex party kind of matters. Um, and then the, the federal district court can order us to do certain kinds of things. But yes, the CAFC is uh, our review in court and um, is in my estimation at least, uh, is much more hospitable to trademarks than uh, had been the case uh, some years ago. Um, we are winning about 90% uh, of our cases. The 90% of the times that my office is appealed to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, we win them. And the uh, TTAB uh, is sustained about 80% of the time at the CAFC. So uh, if uh, one's appeal rate is any measure of uh, how well one is doing under the law, um, we think we're doing quite well. <laughs> Questions? Where does the, uh, where's the district court uh, appeal go to? The circuit court or to the CFC? No, they would go then to their, uh, their regional court, um, which is another problem that obviously takes place sometimes is that trademark cases, uh, you know, the Ninth Circuit is out to lunch on trademark issues most of the time, and sometimes the Eighth Circuit mimics them, and uh, uh, the Second Circuit has its own set of ways of doing things, so that um, it certainly is one of the problems. Unlike patents, uh, appeals can be taken to the regional courts and therefore you have your uh, disparity in some issues. Yes? Uh, can you tell us something about notice requirement for uh, trademark? <laughs> what does the R in the circle mean? How do you get it? And yes. All of that? Under the statute it is improper to use the R in the circle until you have a, a trademark registration. Um, other than that there are almost no rules. Uh, I mean most people uh, in other words, a failure to give notice to someone is generally not going to be important in a proceeding somewhere. Um, the more frequently one has not just dropped off, say, TM or SM or an asterisk with a footnote saying this is a, a trademark of you know, XYZ company, uh, those are obviously people who do it correctly will make sure that they follow certain protocols of not using a possessive on their trademark, not pluralizing it if it's not plural, of using the generic with it like, you know, Kleenex brand tissues and, and uh, most trademark owners uh, have full-time departments that write to reporters to basically say, you've misused our trademark. Um, so there certainly are etiquettes of how to use the trademark, but in terms of the notification proceeding, other than saying, 
do not use the artist circle until you have a valid trademark registration. And we do question that. If we get a specimen that shows an unregistered mark with R in the circle, we slap their wrists. Uh, we don't follow through on it just to say, send us a specimen that shows that uh, you've used it in a, an appropriate way um, before you have your registration. Uh, no. But other than that, the informal trademark notification is really almost a stylized a function of the style of the company. Now, what is TM or registered? What do those mean? Well, those, those are basically, as I was suggesting, uh, are informal ways for which there are no rules. So that uh, I think most companies, you know, American Express is one I know. I know their trademark uh, department uh, folks very well. They really ride herd on using their trademarks correctly every time and feel very strongly about that. So that, you know, they will use a TM, an SM after the service marks to say to anyone and everyone, we think this is our trademark. So no one can allege, you know, I didn't know that was being used a as a source indicator. Um, but there really are no written rules about that and uh, it's simply something that different companies decide to do differently. Um, the more complicated ones clearly are an asterisk or some other kind of note and then you look down at the bottom of the carton and you will see all their corporate relationships and uh, you know their this is our mark don't get close to it kind of stuff so it, it really is a a function of probably marketing and uh, how vigilant is the trademark department. Um, certainly the, the, the the companies, trademark owners, who are not vigilant can sometimes help us make our case. I mean, we will use the specimens of the applicant sometime to demonstrate you are using this term in a descriptive manner. You have the same term you're alleging to be a trademark. You use it in the middle of a sentence as a noun. Um, and, uh, you know, so we will, that's not usually the only evidence we have of descriptiveness, for example, but certainly we'll be simply piling on of, uh, you know, you folks are, are not using this in a trademark sense. Back here. Um, if you don't qualify for federal protection, are there state systems of registration of any kind? Or yes, there. I think probably there are at least 51 uh, state and DC systems uh, for state trad trademark registrations. But uh, McCarthy, the leading treatise in the trademark area, says uh, something like, and this is not a direct quote, but uh, in large part, it's kind of if they make you feel good, pursue them. But uh, most of them are not worth the paper they're written on. Uh, so that uh, it really is something for that area. Many of them, unlike an examination system, are simply a deposit system. So they're not going to do a lot of likelihood of confusion kind of analyses. Now, some are more sophisticated. California, for example, does have a similar likelihood of confusion kind of issue. Um, but for the most part, um, the federal trademark registration um, is the type of protection that trademark owners who feel seriously about protecting their trademarks are going to pursue. Next one. Uh, what about phonetically spelled words that are misspelled? Does that get around your descriptive mark position? No. If you put car cleaners, K A R K L, or whatever. Oh, that we we see that uh, hundreds of times every day, um, and uh, basically that does not get around the descriptiveness. It's it, 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 uh, if it's a phonetic equivalent of something descriptive, uh, I mean, we have, for example, uh, in different kind of, uh, for, for paints and, and other finishes, there are uh, whole uh, drawers that are not the correct spelling of coat. I mean, there's C-O-A-T, there's K-O-A-T, there's C-O-T-E and K-O-T-E, and the examining attorney has to search every one of those potential phonetic equivalent for likelihood of confusion, and the same rules really apply for descriptiveness, so that if you have a composite mark with that kind of misspelling in, we will simply have you disclaim uh, those words uh, using the correct spelling, saying, I don't claim any exclusive right to use the term, you know, what you, your example, car clean or whatever, um, so that it's clear both to registrant and to their competitors that this particular generic terminology has not been appropriated by this particular party and that no one can appropriate it. So it really does not... Um, what we do is we have a composite mark that has generic or descriptive terms in it, but has other uh, arbitrary source identifying uh, characteristics. The registration will actually show the terms that we have made clear uh, to the world. This party does not have exclusive right to. What they have is a right to this composite, and we make likelihood of confusion determinations. We have to look at the entire thing. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the rules are that uh, you know, arbitrary things are going to weigh more heavily 
than non-arbitrary matter in making a likelihood of, of uh, confusion determination. Um, is that clear? Here. Yes. Uh, would you comment, please, on your office's position regarding the use of the notice of copyright in the uh, official gazette? My understanding is that uh, that is matter that we require to be uh, excluded from the uh, actual trademark. Um, I don't know that I can say that we consistently, that we've done that in every case. Maybe your question suggests that we haven't always. But uh, my, uh, my understanding is that that is matter that is, uh, is generally going to be excluded from the, uh, the mark as published in the Official Gazette and as it appears in the registration. Just like we don't let Arden Circle on there, it's not part of the mark. That there's no uh, approved formula. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm referring mm -hmm. to pictorial marks. Yeah. My, I mean, my sense is that what we generally do, on, on, and I can't think of a situation where the the copyright notice is going to be an integral part of the mark. We basically say this isn't part of your trademark. Take it out of there. Uh, send us a new drawing, or in some cases where it's uh, easy enough for the examining attorney to do, they can. You know, white it out, or uh, I'm sorry, they can use uh, liquid uh, uh, <laughs> correction fluid. Uh, can you rewind the tape and start that over? Again? Um, they they can they can actually make some corrections themselves uh, to it to get that out of there. But uh, to my knowledge, we treat it identically to the way we do the uh, the R in the circle. We uh, say it's not part of the mark. Back here in the back. I've often seen cases of. Well publicized on um, the matter of uh, likelihood of confusion, and quite often the products are totally dissimilar and they're totally unrelated. And I just go, how could someone file a suit thinking that that this mark is going to be confused with their mark? I mean, they're totally unrelated products, different parts of the country, everything. You got my reaction exactly when I read those cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the fact is that uh, it's it's more so in the federal courts. Um, but uh, even some of the uh, oppositions that are brought, and obviously as one who is responsible for the ex-party prosecution and protecting the rights of registrant in, the, in that ex-party prosecution under likelihood of confusion, I have a great deal of interest in who it is that brings oppositions before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. And I'm happy to say that a significant number of those fall into s several categories. One are the people who don't have a federal trademark registration. They're relying on their common law rights. Well, obviously, we don't protect common law rights. We just use what's in front of us on the registry. But secondly, many of the ones that claim a registration, um, I can't figure out why they filed a suit. They must know something about their goods or channels of trade or something uh, about their litigation strategy or ultimate goals that I don't know about. Uh, some of them appear to me to be somewhere between harassing uh, and simply misguided that, that someone thinks they have some trademark rights in gross or that uh, they own this term. Well, one doesn't get trademark rights in gross. Uh, basically, you get rights as applied to particular goods or services. So I share your kind of uh, reaction uh, of, I don't understand why these were filed. Uh, and unhappily, there are some uh, federal uh, district court judges who actually find likelihood of confusion in some of these cases that uh, you know we simply disregard uh, because it just doesn't make sense to us uh, what they found. And you assume that there's some kind of other equities going on. There's some kind of, you know, defendant was a bad person, uh, which has very little to do with uh, the, the really the holding of the case in terms of looking at the goods and services of the respective parties and their two marks. Because in your remarks, you mentioned the fact that the products have to be similar, or you look at the things you look at are similarity in nature and, uh, you know, product market and this kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be likely to, likely to be confused. Yeah. Well, at, at the TTAB, they are pursuing uh, at the direction of the CAFC a very aggressive summary judgment kind of proceedings, and you know they will, on occasion, uh, you know take those things uh, as summary judgment and simply you know cut them off uh, earlier in the process. But uh, yeah, it's free country, you know. It's the Dan Quayle. It's lawyers are screwing up the country, and uh, a lot of them out there doing it. <laughs> yeah. When your examiners are searching, what kind of search uh, facility or capability do they have available online? Do they use any private search services? We have both uh, uh, manual and uh, online systems. 
Uh, our uh, paper files are also in our building now, uh, and uh, they're massive. And thing, drawings of marks are filed, both registered marks and pending marks, um, are filed according to alphabetically by uh, you know first words and significant uh, uh, significant parts of words. Um, drawings uh, of uh, symbols of, of pictorial kind of representations are filed according to geographical and scenery and all those kind of things. Um, so that we give the examining attorneys the option of searching the paper files once again because of the slowness of our automated system. Um, our T-Search uh, automated system is something that we pretty much designed uh, as a black box system that the, the way it works, it's a very good system, it works well to get you the proper result. The database is pretty good and if you put the right input you will get a good result back. Unhappily, uh, the equipment is lousy. It's 30-year-old hardware. It's 25-year-old software. I mean, most of you in this room who have a PC at home have a lot more horsepower than we have to search images. And it takes incredible periods of time to download these images. Unfortunately, we got locked into uh, uh, a system that uh, is not compatible with uh, IBM kind of compatible systems, and we're having to rescan all of our drawings. And, uh, you know, between the Brooks Act and, uh, you know, people designing the system who don't work for my boss or me, um, I have been singularly unsuccessful in being able to get a new system, and we've been working at it a long time. So basically we do have, and the, the thing is, although it takes a long time, the computer is sitting there, it, it tells you it's working, and it's working, and it's working. And so I have examining attorneys who are very good and capable who are sitting there reading novels in the Washington Post waiting until the search result comes up, and uh, it's, a, it's a shame, but um, it's unhappily part of automation of the federal government. Do you ever refuse registration because a mark is too de minimis? That is, there just isn't enough of it to support a registration? Help me understand what you mean by not enough of it. Well, for example, uh, a, a line is maybe a slight curve or a, a line with a book in it or something like that. Yes. Well, we basically under section uh, 1, 2, and 45, section 45 defines what a trademark is. Uh, two basically says you can't refuse it unless uh, a trademark unless it fits in one of these categories. Um, what we basically do with those kind of things is say it simply doesn't function as a trademark. You don't have a trademark here. Now the, the easier ones to discuss are if it's a carrier. If you basically have a trademark and you have it in a circle and then someone takes out the, the, the words and simply comes in with a circle. Now that's an easy one. It's kind of like, well no one they see that the circle as something that carries your trademark. If you come in with the circle and the words, we'll register it. But that circle doesn't function as a source indicator. Now, your line kind of thing is an interesting one. If it's simply a line on goods, people can see that as decorative. Or that's an easy case. It doesn't function as a mark. There are lines, however, that do function as marks. If it's a colored line, that is one of every third strand in a rope. Um, so that, you know, you basically have a way in which uh, you could see some things that look like lines, uh, but it's the dotted line that shows the rope and, and then a, a colored line or usually the easier cases are where you have a green and a blue line that are worked together. So the, the trademark is, you know, rope that has intertwined, uh, you know, green and, and red uh, twines or something like that. In the back? Your refusal to register under the, uh, what you were saying, the section that you were... Doesn't function about. as a mark? Take part. The, doesn't function as a mark in response no, to the last the, question? Uh, Scandalous and immoral. That yeah. Kind of is that ever challenged on First Amendment basis? It is, and and that's this this uh, old glory uh, condom case, uh, and this guy really is a self promoter. I mean, we're doing him a big favor. I think he was hoping that we would refuse it because he gets wire service stories every time he gets an office action. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing is, it's you know the wire service story, and we get the clipping from the clipping service. Every small town paper across the country loves this. This is about as close as they can get to the line, I guess, to titillate their readers. Um, <laughs> the the words are the same throughout. Uh, and sometimes the picture is the same, but the headlines are just wonderful. I mean, the, the local company, the local paper must have the right to, to write their own headlines, and uh, they're, they're amazing. But what we're, uh, what's going to make this case, and, and they're, you know, take it to the Supreme Court, and uh, the, the, uh, the people who are representing them now are the uh, lawyers' committee under the Constitution, which represent the flag burners before the Supreme Court. So we may have... Um, another case headed toward uh, the CAFC or uh, um, the, um, the Supreme Court. Now, interestingly, there's, I think, uh, in the next month or two, going to be an article in the Trademark Reporter dealing with this very issue 
of commercial free speech and First Amendment uh, legal developments uh, as it affects uh, the scandalous and immoral uh, refusals. Um, I happen to be one who thinks the First Amendment isn't implicated when we make those decisions because we're not saying you can't use it. We're simply saying we're not going to put the imprimatur of the United States government behind protecting it. Uh, I think it's arguable that uh, some of the recent Supreme Court decisions on commercial free speech could say, but you're not giving those evidentiary and remedial kind of rights that go along with trademark registration, so you are taking something away. Uh, so it's going to be interesting, and uh, it's going to force the issue of uh, First Amendment uh, under the... Now, we have taken the position that it's a different standard. It's not the Miller standard of obscenity. Uh, it's a much lower standard that we have to meet. Um, but uh, one of the cases that was decided uh, that I lost a month's rent on uh, under this uh, uh, section statute was Big Pecker, which uh, is a restaurant uh, on the eastern shore. And uh, uh, I felt certain that we were going to win that case under 2A. Uh, we pulled three males who grew up as jocks in locker rooms, and uh, they couldn't find any problem there saying this is a bird with a big beak. So. <laughs> Next question. Um, there have been a number of cases in copyright where uh, people have lost their rights because they forgot to renew when they needed to. Um, you mentioned that you have 10 year renewal and it can be done forever. Are there any new cases where uh, some famous company just forgot to renew and lost? Well, not really, because here's, here's why. Well, two things can happen. One fact situation is simply an oversight in renewing the registration. And if there's not any good reason, it's a statutory requirement, they can't pick up the pieces of that registration. But they can file again and get a new application going. Uh, but if, in fact, they're making commercial use, if they're still using it, and it was simply a, an inadvertence, an oversight, a not renewing it, they still have those common law rights. They still have that bundle of sticks that any third party who's going to step in the breach and try to start using it um, is probably going to lose ultimately. Uh, if they, In other words, if they send an application to us, if not a registration, we will examine it. We will send it out for opposition, uh, and the trademark registrant will oppose it. They will be able to prove their continuous use dating back to a prior period and that registration will be abandoned, that application will be abandoned. Now the other more difficult problem is where there really is a period of non-use uh, and the statutory presumption of abandonment of a mark is two years. So for two years you don't use the mark, uh, the presumption is that you have abandoned that mark and that's where some of the more difficult contentious issues come with the person who says, well you weren't using it, uh, I adopted it, now it's my mark. Um, and it gets into a whole series of questions as to whether, in fact, they had the intention of uh, abandoning the mark um, and whether this new party um, is now the rightful owner of that matter. Do we have someone who hasn't asked a question? Um, I'm wondering on what basis uh, you determine whether something falls under this scandalous and immoral uh, uh, provision. And does, do you see it at all related to the political climate of the Yes, um, uh, the um, the commissioner doesn't like the Big Pecker decision, for example, and uh, n nobody goes out of this room and talks, do they? <laughs> um, you know, we had we had a case from the Hooters restaurant, and uh, you know they basically have expanded well beyond restaurants to videotapes and uh, magazines with centerfolds and a whole variety of other things, and. Pardon the expression, I told the commissioner I thought this was on all fours with uh, the Big Pecker decision, but he liked the Hooters uh, uh, mark. So um, uh, it's, you know, it's really difficult because it is in the eye of the beholder, and he really wanted to say, you know, I don't want to be called up to Congress, for example, and ask them for, you know, another $500 uh, uh, million dollars to run this organization for another year and have a representative wave in my face, uh, you know, what kind of crap are you guys registering? Um, so it really is a political kind of thing, and it's difficult to know. I mean, when I went up to talk to the commissioner about my decisions, since I'm the one who makes them, I had a list of 30 cases that I dealt with in the month before that with the marks and the goods. And I will have to tell you that uh, 
he and I disagreed on a lot of them. Things I felt strongly about, uh, he thought were funny. And uh, ones that I thought, uh, you know, were really okay, he somehow found offensive. So it's, it's a difficult area. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you really are tiptoeing through. Um, I don't know that any, any representative have, has ever done that kind of thing. I think more likely when we get calls congressionals, it's because, uh, you know, poor mom and pop have been slandered by one of my examining attorneys. They've meant nothing by it. and It's just uh, one of my examining attorneys is down in the gutter in some way uh, by seeing something that's not there. Um, although some of them don't take much imagination at all. <laughs> my reaction on those is, is uh, you know, it's just sad that there's a market for this kind of stuff uh, out there. Um, and many of them abandon after we make the refusal. But to answer your question, I mean, I had set up to let people know where I was coming from, things I felt strongly about. And clearly, uh, you know, racial kind of things, violence against women. I'm a feminist, so I felt very strongly about uh, uh, things that I thought were exploitive, uh, uh, and and some of them take uh, very little imagination. And uh, but you know, we have to draw the line somewhere between Venus to Milo and uh, Hustler, and uh, we get the whole spectrum. Um, let's see here. Um, you mentioned uh, that there are some uh, decisions that you find a little off the wall. Uh, does your office go forth and file a thanks to the court brief when you feel that there's an issue coming up that's not coming to your administrative uh, circuit that you feel could have some kind of effect upon uh, uh, at least the common law interests that you feel are contrary to the federal statute? I don't know that we've ever done that. Now, of course, the solicitor who works for the commissioner uh, does represent the office uh, where the office is a party uh, to some issue, uh, but very rarely do we do that. Now, we have filed a number of amicus briefs before the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit because they are our reviewing court, and we have the most concern about their correctly deciding trademark cases. Um, so that the only times, and it's very rare that we've even done that. Um, no, we basically, I guess, kind of have said we don't have the resources to do that, um, you know, for every Ninth Circuit case, there's a good Fifth Circuit or something like that decision, and we're not bound by them. Uh, the only things we're really bound by, in a sense, is what the CAFC has uh, has decided. Okay. Okay. We get a lot of applications for names of groups, musical groups. I wish to trademark the name of my band, and of course we can't register a name. Do we refer them to you? Do we, How can we best advise an applicant that... I mean, how much protection is there for the name of their band, and what do you do with those? Well, it, the, the, uh, the first issue probably is what are they trying to seek registration for? Let's assume it's the name of the band, but is it for records, or is it for performing, or what is it for? Now, a lot of, of bands and other entertainment groups are registered as service marks. Basically, they're, they're providing an entertainment service, and you know, we will register that without any problem. Uh, basically, it's like any other service, whether it's the, the Bullets, the Redskins, or ABBA. I mean, it's, you know, it's basically the, the service mark meets all the criteria that I basically set out, and it's going to be entertainment services in the nature of, you know, rock band or something like that. Um, the more difficult one has to do with uh, records, for example, uh, and there's actually a case with ABBA uh, where they were trying to get a trademark for records, and they were basically saying, but we have our own record label. That raised a more serious question as to whether a single record with the band's name in the middle is going to serve as a source identifier for a record. Uh, and then it gets into the whole single work versus series. And, uh, you know, I think they were able, as I remember that case, they were able to, to demonstrate that they have produced a whole series of records. And it's not just seen as the name of the group, but as someone who stands behind the quality of the, the vinyl, um, the, the cutting. Okay, back here. Yeah, um, you said you can make a registration based on intent to use. Yes. Now, is that only for international or is that for... No, that's for everyone. Everyone. Yes. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, November 16, 1988, um, President Reagan signed the Trademark Law Revision Act of 88. I think that's the same day he signed the uh, Exceeding to the Berne Convention. Um, and again, I won't share my political uh, viewpoints, but I guess... Maybe some of you in this room have trouble associating Ronald Reagan with intellectual <laughs> pop property. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, the, the fact is it went into effect. It went into effect. It went into effect on November 16, 1989. On that date, we got 3,000 
uh, applications on that very date because of the new benefit of this nationwide constructive use. That, to give you some sense, obviously, when we get 4,000 applications <laughs> a year uh, in the 70s uh, and 80,000 before that, it was basically a, a couple of weeks, and then it continued at a very high level. Um, and we are now getting about 48% of all of our filings are intent to use filings. Uh, and the majority of them are domestic owners. In a sense, they went from waiting until they made use to actually, uh, as soon as they have adopted a mark, of basically sending in an application. Um, and what that permits them to do, it's in the clearance process. If we reject it based on likelihood of confusion, or uh, a competitor brings an opposition, they may have four or five marks in the works and they simply drop that one and will make commercial use with the millions of dollars on the average it takes now to launch a new uh, product line uh, nationwide. They will wait until they know that they're going to get a registration. There's not going to be an opposition. There's not going to be a re an ex parte refusal on the part of our examining attorney. And now they start gearing up to actually use that mark. The difficult questions that practitioners and others deal with <coughs> under the new intent to use is if a pharmaceutical company has a single product line uh, and they've come up with five marks they like, um, you know, you send in f application for five uh, marks and you know you're only going to use one of them. Uh, is that in some way going to invalidate your claim on each of the five that you have a bona fide intention to use the mark in commerce? And I think, you know, the answer kind of is, well, three or four, that's, that's probably okay. And so long as you very carefully document at such point as test marketing doesn't work on the one, you send in a note saying abandon that application and start the, the winnowing down process. Um, you know, can you send in 10 for each of the product lines? Uh, it's like eating prunes, you know, how many is too many? But anyway. Yes, here. That's what I wanted to uh, start uh, a product. I wanted to, to distribute a product line. And I wanted to do my own research as a private citizen into what marks are out there. I don't want to step on anybody that tells me problems. Is there a source where I could go as a private person to look up on? Yes. The, until quite recently, the only place you could do that was to come to the trademark office in Crystal City and uh, the search room people there will give you pointers into how the search room is set up, that you need to search the pending non-registered, that you need to search the registered marks, that they're organized alphabetically, and if you have a design feature you're concerned about, here is the where you will find the various designs, and here's the U.S. class system that uh, uh, decides how designs are uh, uh, put in the drawers. Uh, we actually call them shoes, an interesting aside. Thomas Jefferson was the first uh, uh, commissioner of patents, um, and uh, he basically kept the uh, uh, patent uh, documents in shoe boxes. And to this day, both in the patent core and in the uh, trademark area, the little drawers that we keep the copies of registrations in are called shoes. So one would come down and look in the shoes uh, and basically uh, you know, see what's there and do a search yourself uh, and make a determination now. So we've got lots of people coming off the street every day who do that. Um, you know, as to whether they really understand which all drawers they need to look into, what all could cause a likelihood of confusion. Um, you know, trademarks says, I guess like copyrights and other areas, has become increasingly uh, uh, complex area of the law. Uh, but probably 10% of all of our applicants uh, are pro se's. They basically are doing it themselves. Uh, now, their casualty rate is much higher than those people who have uh, counsel, but um, there's really no prohibition either in searching, doing your own clearance decisions, uh, filling out an application, and our attorneys uh, spend a lot of time both in the telephone and in writing letters trying to walk pro se's through and saying, you know, trying to let them know, you know, we've got a dead on site here, you're, you know, you're just not going to get it, um, versus, uh, you know, you don't have too many serious problems, but, uh, you know, we've got a TMEP that is thousands of pages thick that have all the rules and regulations and what you have to do and can't do and uh, here's how we can help you. So that, um, yes, if you want to do that, you can. Yes. There used to be private search firms that would search each mark for 10 or 20 bucks too. Are they still around? Well, every, everything you've said is true except what they charge. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that uh, there's a possibility that there's a possibility that there's a possibility that there's a possibility That, that's a good question. Uh, trademarks is a territorial kind of thing. So basically you get trademark rights in each country. Each country has its own trademark system. Uh, and it's not really important for us to know too much about 
the uniquenesses of various trademark systems, except as it does affect our obligations under uh, the Paris Convention. And uh, basically we have, uh, under the Paris Convention, we have to accord priority to other countries' uh, trademark applications as they do ours uh, for other members of the Paris Convention. We also have a number of bilateral and other multilateral kind of arrangements uh, that we're uh, party to. Um, the, the, um, the, the quickest way to answer your question is that there is um, a provision under the Paris Convention that we operate under that says if you file in a member country um, a trademark application and then in six months file in another member country, you basically get priority. Your date actually dates back to that date of the first filing anywhere. Um, and that will determine rights so that there is certainly a case even with ITU uh, where some foreigner has filed in their home country, for example, waits six months and files here, and for all intents and purposes, it's the same as if they had filed here six months earlier. Um, and so sometimes someone who will have adopted later, someone who will have filed later, finds that someone has, a foreigner has priority over them under uh, our obligations under the Paris Convention. But there also, that is a basis for filing. If you have basically a home country registration, no priority claims, you've been using it for a long time, you've had your registration for a long time, you can send in your foreign registration and that becomes the basis for a registration in the United States uh, without a need to make use prior to issuing a registration. So we still will issue a registration to a foreigner for, you know, that has the same benefit as other registrations in the United States based on a registration somewhere else in, in their home country. That doesn't give you the priority. They basically have rights on so the latter example. Do you differentiate in any way between common law countries and civil law countries? No. no. Yes? I'd like to ask about dual forms of protection regarding artistic logos. Does it, your, uh, does it have any impact on your examining process if you know if an artistic logo has been registered here in the Copyright Office? And also, when there is some form of uh, infringement, whether there's any advantage or of filing uh, infringement based on the trademark or based on the copyrightable content, and or could someone file a claim on, on for infringement of both forms of protection? Well, I think certainly there are cases where you know, Quail's lawyers do, uh, you know, file on every basis they can think of, and it's not uncommon to see cases where there are both trademark and copyright issues that seem to grow out of the same matter. Um, I'm having trouble, I guess, answering your question head on. Certainly, the, the, uh, the same matter can function uh, both as a copyright and a trademark. Um, but we're, we're really, under the different statute that we have, our, our question really goes to, is it a source identifier? I mean, is this the way that uh, this merchant or manufacturer has chosen, or this performing artist or group or whatever has used to let people know that this indicates a common level of quality of performance or product. Um, and uh, so that the mere fact that there may be a copyright notice next to something, the mere fact that it may function as, you know, an artistic uh, copyright does not preclude it in any way from, you know, trademark uh, uh, protection. I mean, the whole Tiffany lamp kind of thing, I think, is one that in some old articles I've seen you know, a, a trademark is not a patent, is not a copyright, but looks at the fact that the electrical apparatus may have some patent rights, that the, the Tiffany and the glass kind of uh, things may have copyright values, maybe even the shape of the base or something like that. On the other hand, Tiffany, uh, you know, is a trademark. So I, I think, you know, they're, they're really, there's, there's overlapping kind of protections there. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not really getting your question uh, the way you intended. I haven't seen any cases where they where they're filed as a new, let's just say, pick the, the big boy picture. Let's okay. just say that that, that image that was registered here in the Copyright Office, and I, it was registered in, in, in your office, if it went into litigation, that, would they sue on the basis that this is an infringement on the trademark? Or are there any advantages of doing it that way? Or suing on the basis of copyright infringement? Or would they well, let me ask you, because I don't know. What is the standard that you would use on, on uh, copyright infringement? Are you talking about a restaurateur who is using uh, an obese little fat-faced kid holding a burger? Is that <laughs> I mean, I guess what I don't know is it would seem to me the question would really depend. If, if it's someone who uses the exact image but is, is not in the restaurant or food business or whatever, they're probably not going to bring a trademark. If we're talking about a competitor, um, 
there may be a case in which it differs enough from the big boy uh, logo that there's a likelihood of confusion, but there may not be copyright infringement because of enough changes. I don't know. Um, but, but I guess all I'm saying is I think probably intellectual property lawyers who have copyrights and trademarks and feel they've been infringed, uh, you'd have to talk them out of using both. Uh, and I would guess that there are advantages um, to using trademarks in some cases and copyrights in others. Uh, and I don't know, you know, on the extremes you basically have somewhere probably they'd be laughed out of court if they tried to use the copyrights and others where the trademarks aren't relevant. But I think there's a big area of overlap in the center there. considered a brand new registration uh, it's as if they were starting from scratch again and also after that two year period is the old one then tossed out uh, abandonment is considered there uh, someone could pick up the old symbol for what it might be worth that, that's another good question um, as, it, as a matter of fact, uh, we can all think of examples from the Morton Salt girl to uh, Betty, you know, Crocker, Betty Crocker is a very good one, Aunt Jemima, exactly. Um, what usually happens is trademark owners will um, file a new application with their modernized version. There is, uh, there is an ability to amend marks, but uh, it has a material alteration kind of standard. So, and it really goes back to the original registration. The question is, how much can you change it and still have the same mark? Um, and so, in, in most cases, what happens is they will let that old registration expire. Uh, they will file a new uh, registration. But uh, in litigation, for example, they may claim against some person who's claiming common law rights that put them junior to the old registration but senior to the new one, that they can tack on their basic rights and that while it is different and while they sought a new registration in a sense their rights go way way back and and courts would permit that kind of tacking if they haven't made significant changes in the mark but for our purposes uh, both because uh, amending under section 7 is difficult because we really do try to make sure that we keep a fairly tight standard of material alteration and as you think about it if you basically have someone who has an incontestable registration it's been around a long time there is no way a third party can go after you. And if we were to willy-nilly start changing those things radically, that party has no recourse. Um, so that, you know, the, the very reason for a pretty tight material alteration standard, both in examination from the time the original drawing comes in until we issue a registration, in the post-registration period or any other time, is to simply say we have this process that lets third parties engage in an opposition. If they miss it then, they can bring a cancellation proceeding during the first five years. They have their recourse. But if we now have an incontestable registration and we start tinkering around with the mark, maybe the first time even it's not a big problem, but the second time, after a while, you can have something that looks very little like that original thing that third parties had a chance to go after. So that um, I think from the standpoint of practitioners and in-house counsel in the office, strong preference is to simply deal with this new uh, modernized logo form as a new trademark application. We also claim prior registrations, so the record will show they can print up to three registrations that they claim as that they're owners of. So we'll simply say, you know, registrant is the owner of registration number, and then list the uh, the marks that they have already registered that they're claiming ownership of. So you kind of provide that continuity. Here, the blue dress. As far as your office functions, um, you said that your examiners try to do a lot of their business by calling um, the admitters. Is the opposite possible? Can somebody who submitted a claim to trademark call the examiner directly? Yes, yes. In fact, on some cases where the issues are rather complex and drawn out, we will um, issue an office action because we feel that's the best way to lay it in front of them. But we have four paragraphs. Uh, we use four paragraphs for everything. But we have four paragraphs that we encourage the attorneys to throw in saying, you know, please give me a call. Uh, so we can talk about this. So very many of the things when we issue an office action because we feel compelled to or we weren't able to reach the attorney, uh, we played telephone tag for a couple of days and, and then decided to, to move the case on out with a written office action. We'll say, give me a call. I think we can resolve this uh, over the telephone. So it happens both ways. In the back. Does the uniqueness requirement for a trademark extend internationally? I mean, for example, someone applies for a trademark in the United States and uh, maybe unbeknownst to the applicant, you know, the same mark is being used, I don't know, in Australia, for example, for a similar product. Does that preclude them from registering a trademark in the United States? No. 
I mean, basically, we, in terms of the substantive sections of the Lanham Act that we use in uh, prosecuting trademark applications, we basically apply the same standard to everyone here, and we don't look at what is registered in foreign countries. Uh, and so they're basically making claims as to the United States. We are examining it as to registered marks and earlier filed applications in the United States. And all the substantive sections that I talked about, from likelihood of confusion to descriptiveness, genericness, um, does it function as a mark, the same standard is applied. In fact, that's part of the Paris Convention is these are the certain minimum kind of things that every country who's a member has to ascribe to, but they're pretty low thresholds in terms of the, what has to be the same. Um, but what you can do as a member country is apply your own domestic law, and as long as you apply it equally, to your own uh, domestic trademark owners and foreign filers. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, about a half a year ago, I think there was some publicity about a lawsuit between Beretta, the, the um, gun manufacturer, yes. and Beretta, the, the uh, car dealer, yeah. uh, Chevy mm -hmm. name. And is the gun manufacturer then getting bad advice based on what you said? from his corporate lawyers to bring lawsuit to this, or at least? Well, I think, you know, there was a certain uh, amount of disingenuousness, I think, uh, you know, on the part of uh, GM at that point. I mean, to say, you know, hey, we didn't know there was a Beretta gun. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's one of the cases where uh, you, you're testing the limits of, say, strong marks, famous marks, uh, which get a broader scope of protection. Um, the the, the uh, Nexus case was another uh, interesting one, um, where you had uh, Lexus Nexus from Me Data versus uh, the the Lexus automobile, and uh, I mean you had the was it the concurring or dissent trying to say, well of course there's no confusion. I mean one is Lexus and the other's Lexus. Like, give me a break. I mean there's there's not likelihood of confusion. I don't think, but it has very little to do with the pronunciation of those two words. Um, well, based on what you know, said about the two competing against each other, there is no doubt that they're not in the same yeah. market, so therefore it should never be brought to... Well, I don't, really, I don't really remember. I don't really remember how they resolved that. Do you remember? No, I, that's... You know, was it brought to your office? No, it wasn't. It was, it was in the federal courts. Um, I don't really remember how that one was resolved, um, but clearly from our standpoint, if we had a mark for guns and for automobiles, we would not cite the one against the other. Now, certainly there are... You don't have to move too far from guns to some other mechanical kind of devices that one might say, well, auto manufacturers, if they're branching out or, I mean, certainly auto parts, tires, for example, versus automobiles, that's, that's a fairly easy one. Although even there, there's been some uh, people saying original manufacturers don't sell tires and everybody knows that. Um, and so the cases have gone both directions on the tires versus automobiles. But certainly, you know, speedboats versus automobiles, well, that, the same mark there is a problem. But just in terms of competition, uh, competitive, uh, um, of course, I don't know, increasingly you pick up the papers or listen to the evening news, it may be that uh, automobiles and guns are becoming complementary products. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you comment on um, the situation of marks that are strong arbitrary marks like Kleenex or Xerox, yeah. and then with time they become generic names at the time of renewal? Yeah. Is it possible that you would refuse uh, renewal? No, we, we have never done that. It basically is something that uh, the FTC got involved with in the fiberglass issue some years ago. Um, but no, we don't do that. I mean, basically that's something that is is more suited to the inner parties kind of process. Um, so and that, have to get results. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I have an eight-year-old who's probably one of the few eight-year-olds who goes around talking about tissue brand, uh, I mean, Kleenex brand tissues, uh, and uh, all, all my former friends use their trademarks correctly. <laughs> yeah. Is this what is known as dilution of a trademark when it becomes generic? Is that it's well, no, dilution is really closer to the Beretta example here, I think. It basically is where, uh, and these are state laws, there is no dilution uh, in the federal law. Uh, it was tried in the Trademark Law Revision Act of 88 and, and was not made part of, of the statute. Dilution is really almost the flip side of likelihood of confusion. I mean, likelihood of confusion is, you know, where you basically establish some relationship between the goods uh, or services. Um, dilution is basically claiming no relationship between the goods. It's simply kind of a, a weakening away. It's the tarnishment. It's the drip kind of theory of, you know, if after a while you have people all over who are using our mark, it is diluted as a source indicator for our products. 
So that uh, New York, some years ago, is where dilution started, and it has spread to a number of other states um, with some mixed results. And I think some of the proponents of dilution 20 years ago are starting to question this value. Um, but in a sense, the, the, the Beretta example, or maybe even the Lexus, is more a case of where if, if I were representing someone who alleged I had a fairly well-known mark and I had products that were very different, I would definitely go after dilution. Now, people will argue these things as mutually exclusive claimed remedies, so inevitably, if, if you're in a federal district court, they will bring a federal 43A, they will bring a section 32 uh, you know, infringement, they will bring dilution under their state statutes and uh, you know, a whole variety of other kind of trade dress or other kind of, of things. So, but no, what she's talking about is really the kind of the uh, genericism of a mark because a company will not, doesn't police it correctly. I mean, you know, Xerox is one of the ones who, you know, Xerox has two R's. Uh, you know, that kind of, um, and, and they will do significant, as I mentioned earlier, letter writing things. Whenever Xerox sees someone using Xerox in lower case to mean copy, uh, they let them know about it. And uh, that kind of effort, if someone tries to say, well, we can use Xerox in a, a generic sense because everybody else is, Xerox has probably three full-time people who can testify to their efforts over the past decades to make sure they stop that. In a sense, you know, it's, it's the ultimate testament to the success of a trademark. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you can't be too successful at it. You've got to make sure. And where this becomes most uh, critical is not with established Xerox and Kleenex and so on, but with newer leading technology kind of products where if you're the first one out of the gate and you've got a new uh, product that nobody else has, if you're going to be successful in your trademark efforts, you really have to come up with two terms. You want to come up with the noun, what this thing is called that everybody's going to refer to it as, and your trademark. What people sometimes do is they come out with a product, they have their trademark, and everyone associates their trademark with this unique product. And uh, you know, after a while, people don't know how to talk about this thing. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are examples with hook and loop type fasteners. What is that? Velcro. Velcro, yeah. I mean, you know, who knows that those are hook and loop type fasteners? That's a generic term for them. Um, and Velcro is a trademark. Um, most of the hook and loop type fasteners you see out there do come yet <laughs> from Velcro. But uh, again, my, my kid has shoes that hook, hey, he says has hook and loop type fasteners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, were they involved at all with the uh, crotch or gamble, crotch and gamble controversy? And was that the symbol that the. Uh, the yeah. rumors were flying all around. Didn't they revise that at least once? Well, you know, it's interesting. I got a call from someone in the commissioner's office who said they understood that one of my employees had posted one of those uh, uh, things in the trademark office. Naturally, I was chagrined uh, that someone from their first Baptist church had brought this thing in, put it in the bulletin board, and were uh, trying to convince their fellow workers not to buy Colgate toothpaste uh, because it was from the devil. Um, we really have not had nothing to do with that. I mean, we basically, it's, it's an old trademark, and uh, uh, I mean, we, we just don't, we're not high publicity kind of people. We have one weekend in the sun, uh, mark it on your calendars. We have Trademark Expo, and it's uh, June 27 and 28 this year, I think, uh, down at the Department of Commerce. It's our one weekend in the sun. But otherwise, we, we maintain a low profile and, uh, you know, find those things to be very interesting. I've only, on, on very few occasions, have I called my friends uh, at the Washington Post to drop a story, the one that I couldn't let go, uh, and once again, don't talk about this outside this room, <laughs> um, was uh, when uh, Donald Trump was getting ready to open uh, the Taj Mahal uh, after having spent $2 billion on a resort, um, I was very much aware of the fact that our uh, little Taj Mahal restaurant close to DuPont Circle had a trademark registration for that restaurant, and uh, that we were refusing uh, the Donald is uh, <laughs> registration. So I called a friend of mine at the Washington Post and dropped the story on her and uh, have not until today publicly taken credit for that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there more formalities in the United States trademark law than other countries? Yes, I, 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 think it's, I think it's fair to say there are. I mean, we really have, and this, this reflects my biases, and, and uh, it was true a decade ago to some degree, it's certainly true now. A, a registration issued from the United States Trademark Office has a quality that most other countries, uh, even including our neighbors to the north that I've visited up there, um, really don't have the same quality. We have attorneys doing all of our examination. I don't think there's another trademark system in the world that relies on attorneys to do their examination. It reflects, I think, an appreciation of how complex can be the issues of ownership, of uh, you know, 
possibility of transfer, uh, all the substantive kind of refusals that I've suggested. Um, it's a very expensive way of doing it, um, but ultimately I think it issues a much higher quality registration because the volume of cases, I think we have to deal with lots of nuances that other countries never face. Uh, in fact, even a lot of European countries, either because of their civil law roots um, or because of the way they permit um, a rather broad identification of goods. Now, there's a nice classification system that has uh, 34 classes of goods and six classes of services into which all goods and services are forced, and we do that. That's part of what we do is we, we use the nice classification system. What happens in a lot of European countries, for example, is the registration will cover international class 25, and that is listed as something like, you know, clothing, including boots, shoes, and slippers. Um, that's the way that the heading is titled. So a lot of, of even European registrations will have a registration covering class 25. Well, we just don't permit that. We basically say, even in an intent to use application, you list every good that you're intending to use it on. And if you're intending to use it on every single clothing item there is, you name them from, you know, cowboy hats to camisoles. I mean, you list them for us. And uh, so that in that sense, and then we only accept certain terms. We don't take nightwear. I mean, what is that? Some people wear different things at night than other people. What, what is it called? Is it pajamas? Or, you, know, you know, there really is a sense in which we have a rigor in our examination that is unmatched. So a, a four-word ID that includes everything in class 25 may in the United States be a three-page ID that lists every single item. That's just a, almost a superficial type of the fact that we do things very differently. Um, ultimately, I think it means the registration has more value. U.S. trademark owners think that's a, you know, an unfairness, that their competitors overseas can get this broad sweeping uh, coverage, and we force them through all these hoops, of, uh, which you know, under the Paris Convention, they then take this registration and go someplace else. So we've set some kind of scope on what it is they can claim when they take this registration to that European uh, counterpart country. Yes? Do they then have to notify you every time they extend their mark to a different product? Well, they don't have to. I mean, you don't have to register. But if they want a trademark registration covering those new goods, they will have to send in a new application at that point. Uh, they can't amend a registration to include new things that were not included. That's kind of like amending the mark. Uh, someone out there who thinks this new product they've added could cause confusion didn't have a right to speak to that. Um, so that, yes, they, they basically, if they, want, if they want the registration to cover those new items, uh, they need to send a new uh, application at that point. But clearly, under the likelihood of confusion issue, if they have a whole bunch of clothing items and before they didn't have neckties, but they had shirts and suits and a whole lot of other things, if they're now using unneckties, um, Someone who goes out and says, oh, but I'm already using it on neckties, and I started three years after you got your registration, they're basically going to get that guy with a cease and desist letter to basically say, no, but that causes likelihood of confusion with my registration of this matter of shirts. So given that, you know, kind of uh, penumbra surrounding their registration, they've got rights that extend out there. They simply don't have it in the registration. But the cleaner way to do it is if you extend to some new product lines, you send in a new application. Would you say that in comparison with copyright law, for instance, our common law plays a much greater role in, in uh, trademark litigation? Why is that? It seems to me that uh, you use much less exact standards in examining trademarks and examining. Is that right? Well, I mean, certainly one of the, the, uh, the primary differences, I think, is there has never been a requirement to register. I mean, basically, you have your rights apart from the registration system. Uh, before the Trademark Law Revision Act, what we'd always say is you've got your bundle of rights. Now, the reason you ought to file is because it's going to help you protect them, both in a def defensive manner and as a sword to go out after uh, potential infringers. Um, and that's still the bulk of it. So in a sense, what people are doing is, is focusing on proving that they actually used it, and there's no, there's no time that starts running. You don't have to file in our office within any set period of time. If you're smart, you're going to. But it really has to do with the, the rights that registration gives you, and particularly now uh, with that contingent constructive nationwide use that goes along with filing. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to start boring you soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here.